Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine monsters and nightmares from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today is almost Halloween, which means we have a very special episode for you guys. We will be taking a look at not one, not two, but three whole vampires, inspired by the ideas placed by you guys in the comments of our channel and Discord server. Vampires are, in the most general terms, undead monsters that feed on the blood or life energy of the living, and there are tons of creatures all over the world that fit that description. So it will be fun to take a look at just three possibilities of what they could be like as real living creatures. So here's a thank you to all who keep posting awesome ideas, and to our patrons and channel members for supporting the channel as well as voting for this episode in our research sponsored Discord. If you too are enjoying this channel's videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing or joining our Patreon. Now, without further ado, let's go meet some vampires. The first research subject we will meet today, as all we will meet, lurks in the shadows of a world where a prolonged ice age brought to existence many like it, who feed on the essence of the living. However, this one is not a monstrous predator, but a human being, affected by a terrible illness in a manner similar to those commonly called werewolves. The patient will become infected after contact with the fluids of an infected person or animal, usually blood or saliva, which contain the virus known as vampiric human lysavirus. This virus is closely related to other lysaviruses, those that cause rabies, and has similar symptoms, including an aversion to water, involuntary muscle movements, uncontrollable excitement and confusion. After a week or two of infection, the infected will begin suffering from a great thirst and be forced to search for sources of fluids other than water, given its aversion to it. While the infected retains most of their mental faculties, their erratic behavior can make it hard for them to find help, so they will instead resort to hunting animals and in some cases, even people in their desperation, drinking their body fluids. An alteration to the taste receptors will produce a positive response to the taste of blood, similar to the response experienced when tasting something sweet. While smaller prey will be killed instantly, bigger prey will easily escape given the usually weakened state of the infected. This, of course, is part of the infection cycle, as this less lethal strain allows the infected to more easily spread the virus to more people. If left in isolation, however, the infected will limit themselves to eating insects and any small animals they can find. This illness was first described at this stage of infection, and named as Renfield syndrome, after the patient it was first described in but is also known archaically, and less sensitively, as the living death, due to the effect its later stages have on the infected. As this infection rages on, the lack of proper nourishment, including fats and vitamins, will begin deteriorating the infected's health. They will quickly lose hair and become emaciated, and their skin will become pale, fragile and thin causing an increased sensitivity to sunlight and chemical allergens. As a result, the infected will begin hiding during the day and coming out only at night to protect themselves, as well as shying away from certain compounds and plants found both in nature and used by humanity, especially garlic. Excess iron in the body, caused by the ingestion of blood and other fluids, will cause hepcidin deficiency inducing a release of iron from the cells, which accumulates in the bones and teeth. Once there, this ferric ion is transformed into ferrous ferric oxide, 
which becomes incorporated into the bones and teeth of the infected, in a similar manner to what is observed in shrews. The teeth will degrade fast due to iron accumulation, causing them to only become fortified once they have rotted away into small, sharp growths on the mouth, leading to another of the illness's names, lithodont vampirism or rock teeth vampirism. In the end, the life of the infected is a cursed, tortured one, and they will weaken gradually until finally dying from malnutrition and internal damage. This awesome concept was built from ideas given by Alec Foisy and Jenny Wolf in our Discord server, where many cool people constantly give us awesome creature concepts, ideas and suggestions to work with, including a special crew dedicated to vampire-specific ideas. In this case, I mostly gathered ideas for some of the concepts developed in the Discord into the mode of a somewhat lesser vampire inspired both by the character of Renfield from the novel Dracula, by Bram Stoker, and some of the uglier vampires seen in many European traditions, a far cry from the beautiful aristocratic vampires that have become popular nowadays. Thanks a lot for the idea, Alec and Jenny Wolf, and thank you to the rest of the vampire crew. Now, let's see the next vampire on our tour. As we go forth, we take a dive into the monstrous, although familiar, with a gigantic predatory wasp, Hemospex vampiria, the vampire wasp. These wasps came from the same ancestors as the skeleton wasp and the zombie wasp. Their gigantism evolved as a way to catch bigger prey in a forest environment where competition from birds was minimal. Their exoskeleton is proportionately much thinner than that of smaller insects, and therefore more fragile, requiring these enormous killers to depend on stealth rather than direct attacks when hunting. The way they hunt is quite similar to that of the skeleton wasp. They will slowly approach prey and pounce on it once they are close enough, killing it with their venomous sting. However, this species will not content itself with eating its prey's flesh. Females during reproductive season will hunt more than usual, often not even eating their prey. Instead, it will make deep cuts using its jaws and drink its victim's blood until leaving it dry using a modified proboscis. This increased nutrient intake allows the vampire wasp to produce much more eggs compared to their other giant relatives, which will hatch inside lonely caves and crevices, and even man-made structures such as crypts and mausoleums, where the mother vampire wasp will leave the remains of its prey for the larvae to feed. In order to avoid predation of the vulnerable larvae, upon being disturbed this will volatilize a compound that produces nausea and drowsiness. In the best cases, the intruder will be unable to live or even move, becoming easy prey to the hungry larvae. While it is a viable strategy, it does require the mother to be quite well fed before having its brood. Otherwise, its numerous eggs will be unviable, the unborn larvae will not develop properly and will die before hatching. This idea was placed in the comments by Gargamel Gold as soon as our second horror wasp was made public. And what better way to bring more joy to our channel than more giant wasps? With this one, what made it distinct was the fact that it feeds on blood, but that was enough to give it a much more specialized biology compared to that of our other horror wasps, especially concerning its reproductive biology which is more in line with that of mosquitoes, as well as including a nod to the fact that vampires are unable to procreate in many a fictional universe. Thanks a lot for the idea, Gargamel Gold. Now, on to our final creature of the day.
our last creature is one that, by convergent evolution, has developed a similar diet to that of its distant cousins from the other side of the world, even if everything else about them is different. Vampire bats, scientifically named Meganicteris hematophaga, are enormous land predators found across Central and Eastern Europe, and can reach heights of a meter and a half, or five feet. Given their great increase in size, vampire bats are no longer able to fly. They walk on their forelimbs like other species of bat do, and are able to run at great speeds. Their wings, however, have not disappeared completely. While very reduced in comparison to those of other species of bat, they still have their uses. Vampire bats can, for instance, stand on their hind legs and open their wings as a display, both to other packs when competing for territory or as a courting display during mating season. Furthermore, these bats will use them to envelop themselves and their cubs while sleeping, helping their bodies retain heat. Their main source of food is meat, both from prey they hunt using their enlarged canines to hold onto it as it suffocates, and from carrion, but they will also lap up their prey's blood. They do not need to drink the enormous amounts of blood that New World vampire bats do, but rather much smaller quantities to satisfy their thirst. Both this blood drinking and their huge size evolved as a result of the latest ice age, during which liquid water was much harder to find and blood proved a small, but not insignificant, source of fluids. Their size, meanwhile, helped these enormous bats better withstand the cold in the steppes of Europe. These vampires tend to rest during the day inside caves, where they are protected from potential predators mainly due to their greater size and social living which prevent other animals from targeting them. After all, any predator foolish enough to attack a vampire bat while it sleeps risks awaking the rest of its pack, a threat few creatures could survive. Interestingly, the presence of many uninhabited man-made structures in modern times has ensured many of these creatures find a good place to call home in places where bigger prey are easy to find. While the value of these creatures to their ecosystem is better understood nowadays, it is not rare that entire mobs will be formed to kill or kick these creatures out of the abandoned castles and ruins they inhabit, from which they can easily target cattle, pets, and even human beings. The last creature in today's menagerie was brought to us by Gerin Jones in the comments of one of our past videos. The relationship between bats and vampires is a really interesting one, since vampire bats are not found in the old world, but only in Central and South America, meaning the connection between these two beings was only established well after vampires became feared among humanity. And yet, it is such an important part of vampire lore and imagery that I knew I had to include it in this video. While the idea for this version was taken almost as it was written, I did adjust a couple of things for the sake of making them fit a real organism better. For example, I felt fangs evolved to hold prey worked better in a big predator, similar to a bear or feline, than venomous fangs did. That said, I loved the idea of this creature a lot and it painted a really vivid picture in my mind that allowed me to very easily picture it as a real living animal. Thanks a lot for the idea, Gedin. And that's it for a speculative biology look into three vampires brought to life by the ideas you guys have placed in the comments of our channel and Discord server. I really loved this idea for making a final episode for our Halloween season. And I'd like to thank all of you for giving cool ideas like this in the comments. So please remember to keep writing in the comments any ideas or even full-blown speculative biology concepts you may want me to draw and talk about on the channel. 
Oh, and before I forget, boo! Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for your ideas, comments, suggestions, and feedback. Thank you for all you've helped this channel grow. Thank you, have a happy Halloween, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.